Hello, everybody, and welcome to class five, where we're going to talk about designing for emotions. Um, this week, we're going to go over in class the recommended reading, which is Pattern Language for Game Design, uh, looking at chapter nine, the emotional pattern section, and then uh, talking about architectural approach to level design, Christopher Totten's book, chapter five, uh, on communicating through art. And then we're going to, communicating through environmental art particularly. Um, we're also going to talk about the emotional engineering article. Um, and I'll go over that briefly during lecture as well. The lecture topics are going to be the lessons from effective sciences. We're going to talk a little bit about arousal and valiance, um, two different aspects of uh, looking at emotions. And we're going to talk a little bit about designing for emotions. The class activity is going to be deriving an emotional pattern. Uh, and you're going to begin work on creating an emotional space as your project this week. Uh, that project is going to be using the pattern you derive in uh, exercise 13 to design a scene that creates a particular emotional response. You're going to provide uh, your description and sketches as usual and try to implement the space in the game engine, uh, including texturing, lighting, uh, and mechanics as much as possible. Um, texturing and lighting are going to start becoming more important, uh, particularly when you're talking about um, creating emotions in the game. Gray boxes are not terribly emotional spaces usually, unless that emotion is frustration. Um, all right, I wanted to take just a moment to talk about problems that some people have with patterns. Um, this slide isn't generated by problems that you all particularly have been having, but cumulatively problems that people have had um, in all the times that I've uh, done this kind of work in classes. So it may not apply to you, but some of these things I've definitely seen uh, in exercises. So when you state uh, the pattern, your statement should be prescriptive. It should be telling the user what to do or the reader now uh, what to do in order to implement the pattern in order to x uh, the developer should y because of z so you know that's x is going to be uh, referring to the problem statement uh, y is going to be re to, uh, referring to the, you know the techniques involved and how to use them and because of z is going to talk about why those things were effective um, in the games that uh, you use as your examples uh, generalizing that part of it so pattern should also uh, address a design problem. You know, that is called out in the fact that you have to list the design problem. Um, it's easy to look at a list of games, um, you know, looking at the mechanics, uh, the elements in the game, and see what kind of thing is being repeated uh, and just sort of state what's being done as the pattern. And that's, that's not the pattern. Um, if you're starting with a list of things that, that the game is doing, then, um, you need to look at all of those things and see why they're doing those things. Um, the reason why they're doing those things, that's the design problem, right? That's not even the pattern. Um, and uh, then you need to look at that list and say, um, you know, if either mechanics or elements or whatever, and uh, look at other games that also are solving that same design problem. Now, some of those may be from your original list. Some may be additional games that you pull in. Um, the common thread through why or what or the common thread through all of the games that are using whatever the technique or idea is to solve a particular problem that's the raw design problem you then need to take that uh, that common thread that repeated um, usage pattern and state it prescriptively um, it doesn't have to follow the exact formula above but it, it needs to be you know in order to apply this pattern you need to do this right you describe the pattern and, and also how it how it is uh, used the technique and how it's used as a pattern um so um that's hard and you know i've said to a bunch of you all that i don't expect everyone to get it uh immediately um you know it often is towards the end of class before even some of the the graduate students are reliably producing patterns that i'm like yes that that is a, a clearly stated well-formed pattern um, and struggling with these things is perfectly normal. Um, you know, even being unable to complete an exercise is, is normal. Um, I need you to persist and, and try to complete it, um, you know, but uh, if you aren't satisfied by what came out of it, um, talk to me about it, you know, say my pattern this week, I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't think it was good. And I will uh, work through it a little bit with you until you can sort of move it forward. Um, so keep going, you're all doing fine, but um, you know, 
consider whether or not you're following that general format, um, which is altered, you know, slightly in each of the exercises, but that's sort of the general process. Make sure you're actually doing that for all of your exercises um, and you'll be fine. All right, let's get on to emotional models. So if we're going to try to create emotions in games, uh, we need to have sort of an understanding of human emotions and a deep philosophical understanding of emotion or a scientific theory of emotions uh, is beyond the scope of this class and, and beyond what we need. But we do need to have some kind of a framework so that we can know if we're going in the right direction so that we can sort of have some idea how emotions might relate to each other. Um, and you know, if you haven't thought about this kind of thing, you could probably list a bunch of emotions, but, um, but how do they work? You know, what, what's connected to what, uh, what, in what kind of emotion encourages what other kind of emotions, um, you know, is, is not something we've necessarily all thought about a lot. Um, so here's a couple of sort of basic, normal, like if you've taken psychology classes, you've probably run into this kind of thing. Um, you know, this isn't uh, advanced theory or anything, but, um, but it's useful for us to, as, a, as a baseline. So um, there's the idea of the circumplex model, which is saying you have valiance, which is whether or not an emotion is positive or negative, and you have arousal saying what level of intensity is that emotion happening at you know is it just a, a low grade emotion um you know or is it is it intense uh you know high grade emotion so you know it says something like a uh negative valence a negative emotion um at a or sorry yes a negative valence and low level of arousal uh, might be something like pensiveness, like thoughtfulness, right? That's not very intense. You're just sort of chilling and thinking about something. Um, that emotion at a higher level of arousal becomes sadness. Um, that emotion at a very high level of arousal is grief, right? So it's saying that those are sort of essentially the same emotion at different levels of intensity. And then going in the opposite direction with that same emotional spectrum, this, this theory postulates that um, the positive version of pensiveness would be serenity. You know, you're chilling, but, but it's, it's a good vibe, right? Um, higher level of arousal would be joy, and a very high level of arousal would be ecstasy. Um, and that those are sort of all, you know, the, is it positive or negative? How intense is it? That's all one sort of emotional bubble. Um, and then um, uh, Pluchik's model is saying, hey, that's pretty cool. Let's take all of the different emotions and put them into little you know, bubble petal shapes like that and arrange them next to ones that are close to each other um, so that you get this sort of flower shape that you see. Um, you know, and so it says that, you know, um, ecstasy, admiration, terror, amazement, grief, loathing, rage, um, uh, and vigilance are all like an intense emotional circle. Um, those are the high, um, high arousal, and then going down to low arousal, um, you know, hope, guilt, appreciation, despair, unbelief, envy, annoyance, pride. Um, and then it, it says some other emotions probably lie in between those at different places. So, they, you know, that's sort of a useful framework to look at. Um, and, you know, if it is, is one emotion next to another one? Is it related closely? Um, you know, amazement and terror being close to each other, loathing and rage being close to each other. Um, so there you go. Uh, further reading, there is a uh, Wikipedia article for emotional classification, breaks down, you know, the basics of this kind of thing. You know, Wikipedia, the cliff notes of the internet. Um, you know, it's uh, don't knock it, but uh, also don't believe it. everything. Uh, check your sources. But um, there you go. And then another one that I think is interesting, um, the jury's sort of still out in the research. I haven't seen this widely adopted, but it's a neat idea. Um, and that's the uh, Lovheim cube uh, of emotion. And that's looking at some data that's around measuring brain chemicals and their relationship to particular emotional states. So the idea that if you have high levels of 
noradrenaline, dopamine and, dopamine and serotonin all at the same time that you end up in an emotional state that uh, is interest and excitement. Uh, if you have high noradrenaline, high serotonin and low dopamine, you're in a state of surprise. Um, high noradrenaline, high dopamine and low serotonin, you're in uh, a state of anger or rage. Um, so that's sort of a neat idea. Wouldn't it be cool if it was that simple? I'm sure it's not that simple. Um, but science moving in that direction, you know, indicates that at some point we might be able to monitor those kind of things, even in real time, and see whether or not our uh, games or environments or the experiences of a person are producing a particular emotional state. Um, and not have to rely on somebody telling you whether or not uh, your game was scary or fun uh, or sad or, or um, joyful to them. Um, it would be neat to be able to actually have science surrounding those things, but we're not quite there yet. And uh, that model may be uh, invalid, but uh, people are thinking in those directions in any case. All right, on to something more practical. Um, this is... Uh, from an article on emotional engineering by Stephanie Bora. Um, and it's a Gama Sutra article linked right there. Uh, highly recommend, uh, well, it was in your reading for the week, so you, you should have checked this one out for sure. Um, just to go over it really quickly, it's looking at four different aspects of game design, um, the actions you can take, the systems in the game, uh, the player's sense of self, and uh, the social connections in the game, social interactions in the game. And then it's saying for each of those areas, how much freedom does the player have? How much mastery over that area do they have? And how much data or information is available to them? Um, and then uh, if that is either too low, low, high, or too high, what kind of emotional uh, state does that evoke? And if it's either low or too high, is, uh, is that element, uh, freedom, mastery, or data, increasing or decreasing um, and that each of the, whether it's increasing or decreasing or stable, uh, gives another different sort of emotional response within those areas. So, for example, um, if you're looking at the game systems and the player doesn't have enough information, but the amount of information that they have is increasing, right? They're getting new information. It's just not, not enough. Then that leads to a sense of curiosity. Um, if they have enough information about what's going on, but the amount of information they have is decreasing, it creates a sense of mystery. They know what's going on, but they don't know what's going to happen next. And so that makes, it makes things seem mysterious, uh, as opposed to they don't know what's happening, but they're finding out, and so they're curious. Uh, and those are slightly different emotional states. Um, you know, and then uh, that creates this, this big chart of different possible emotional states. And you can look at, if you want to create one of those, can you generate um, that kind of uh, level of mastery, freedom, or, uh, or information for the player uh, in order to help evoke that emotional state? So that's probably you know, actionable and useful. Um, it's sort of complicated, but I would spend some time reading it and thinking about it, and then that should, uh, should help inform you know, level design, right? Uh, where are you revealing things to the player? If you're putting them through a maze, are you giving them enough information or not enough information or too much information? Um, and, you know, that's likely to evoke these kind of emotions. Um, so useful stuff. All right, uh, other techniques. So here is an article um, on, for, by Brad Kane on putting into mo emotion into games has 34 different um, sort of aspects of games that you can use to inject emotion into a, a particular part of the game. Um, it's not a very long article. Uh, it's just a short paragraph on each of those 34 things, uh, a couple pages long. So I would read that this week, particularly looking for things related to the kind of scene that you're making. Um, this is going to give you suggestions that are, are actionable for you. Um, and that you should probably pursue and mention to me, you know, hey, we use number 24 from that article, uh, you know, when looking at the scene uh, or our pattern was informed by looking at that or echoes that thing. Um, you know, that's interesting. We found a pattern and then we looked at this list and hey, there it is, um, you know, as one of the, the descriptions. So um, those are all uh, useful things that you can do. Um, all of these different techniques that we're going to look at, the patterns that you arrive at, um, you know, the, 
the ways emotions are laid out, the way you could you know, do the emotional engineering from that uh, chart, how, the way you could apply these techniques. All of these things are cumulative and they're interrelated. So you're not, none, doing no one thing will guarantee an emotional response from a player. Players you know, may or may not respond to stimulus in the way that you expect. Um, you can create something that makes you cry just thinking about it. And other players can be like, oh, I guess. Um, and just not, you know, not have the emotional connection. Um, so you need to combine as many different elements that are all pushing players in the same direction as possible. Um, you know, the aesthetics of the, the game in terms of uh, the visual presentation, the sound design of the game, the narrative story that's being put forward, um, you know, the uh, mechanics that the player is uh, enacting. Uh, all of those things are going to work together to help the player have an emotional response. And the more things that you point in the same direction, the more likely their effect is going to cumulatively create the emotional state that you're looking for. Um, so it's complicated and like you can't just do one thing and be like, oh, I did this to create this emotional state, therefore the player will feel that. Well, probably not. Um, you can do all of the things and the play some players are still not going to feel what you want But the more things you do the more players will have the kind of experience uh, that you are trying to generate All right, and then lastly uh, just as a reminder um, The patterns that you're creating each week are going to be more useful to you in your projects and your assignments um, if you're thinking of level design and thinking of the projects you're going to use them on when you create those patterns and um, I think that the way that I've structured the class at this point and the way I've seen all of you working, that you're pretty much already doing that. Um, you're, you're thinking about the fact that you're going to need to use your pattern to create the kind of effect that you know, we're looking at in a given week, and you're trying to create the right kind of pattern. Um, I've seen you know, a few patterns in this class and a few or plenty of patterns in, in previous iterations where the students come up with a pattern and they're like, but this really doesn't apply to what I'm doing, or I'm having a hard time incorporating that into my level. Um, and I'm like, yeah, you know, that, that pattern just isn't that closely related to what we're doing right here. Um, it's a fine pattern, but, it, but it's not a level design pattern, or it's not you know, a pattern about, you know, uh, that's easy to implement in boss encounters, right? Like you've, you've come up with something that seems reasonable, but it's not helpful. Um, well, you're in charge of making your patterns, right? You get to pick, the topic you're making the pattern on, you get to develop the pattern. If you see that what you're finding isn't going to be helpful to you, take a step back and work in a different direction. Build something that's going to be the thing that you need, right? The, the patterns are tools that you get to build and then use. So you get to be responsible for building the tools that you need. Um, yeah. Um, and I think all of you are doing a pretty good job at that, uh, but I wanted to state it just to be clear. Uh, really quickly to run over the things that we'll be doing in the rest of the class. Uh, as usual, we'll be doing show and tell. Um, in this iteration of the class, uh, which is uh, the spring 2021, uh, there are going to be both classes meeting together this week. And so show and tell is going to take a bigger portion of the class than it usually would. Um, so there'll be less time for other things. Uh, but we're going to go over the readings discussion. Uh, this will be fleshed out a bit, but here's a preview of the things we'll be talking about. Uh, yep, some of those have changed from last semester, so that'll be revised a little. Um, and then we're going to do exercise 12, which is just a short exercise. Um, and uh, it's going to be looking at all of the things that uh, I talked about in the lecture um, and writing about them a little bit. Uh, and then you'll be doing an emotional pattern, which is going to be similar to the player experience pattern that you did earlier in the class, but specifically looking for emotions. Um, and I'll want to run what emotions you choose uh, by me before you start working on your patterns. Um, in the past, I've had uh, players choose patterns that, uh, or choose emotions that are um, not, that don't work very well or aren't really an emotion. Uh, just like sometimes you were uh, having difficulty choosing player experiences that uh, really worked well. So we'll go over those and then you'll work on that for the last part of class. Um, and then to just to finish this up, your assignments, uh, your reading again is gonna be a paragraph in response uh, to chapter six in Architectural Approach to Level Design. 
Um, you're going to be reading a uh, pattern from a pattern language as usual. And then also you're going to be reading um, chapter 14, understanding techniques from the, um, from the pattern language for game design. Uh, so yeah, chapter 14 is not going to be a recommended reading, but is actually required. So you do have a required pattern language for game design reading this week. It's not about a specific pattern. It's about how you're going to use uh, patterns to understand things uh, as opposed to patterns to solve a specific problem, right? Uh, more using patterns as a research tool. Um, your pattern in this case is you're going to be finishing up exercise 13 and documenting that um, in the pattern library. And then your project is going to be using pattern 13 to create your emotional scene. All right. Thank you very much. And I will see you in class.